<laughs> hey guys, it's Dr. Kelsey here again. I am back with Mr. Ryan Humphreys, personal trainer, strength coach extraordinaire. Uh, and today we're going to start by talking about mucus. Mucus? I love mucus. Mucus. <laughs> so, uh, Ryan, did you have some questions about mucus? I have all the questions about mucus. Excellent. Uh, Yes, thanks for having me on again. Yeah. And let's get let's get into the thick of it. All right. <laughs> let's get into the ropey thick of it. <laughs> How many mucus puns can we do on this video? <laughs> All right. So, COVID-19, everybody's talking about it as kind of a respiratory issue, right? We've all heard that ventilators are are needed around the country. We don't have enough ventilators potentially. Um, and from my understanding, right, the immune system is kind of working overtime with this virus. And anytime, I like to think of it as, you know, if pollen comes across, I'm pretty allergic to pollen. Pollen comes across my nose, it gets inside, my body creates an inflammatory reaction, and I sneeze, I produce some mucus so that that pollen doesn't get any further in there than it needs to, right? And that's my body's own response. Yeah. So this virus comes in, our body says, whoa, I'm not sure what's going on. I need to start producing excess mucus. Next thing I know, my lungs are completely filled with crap and I'm in the hospital. Is that kind of what's, what's happening with COVID-19? Yeah, that's, that's pretty close. So mucus is part of our basic inflammatory reaction, right? So, and, yeah. so your analogy is great. Anytime your body comes in, in contact with anything that it doesn't like, we, our mucous membranes secrete mucus partially as a means to like glom on to whatever that virus or bacteria or food or whatever it is to keep it from penetrating deeper into the body. Um, we know that one of the primary sites that the coronavirus is uh, targeting are the, the deep cells of the lungs. So like the lowest down, like low down cells. And uh, when that happens and our immune system, our cytokines that we talked about in our last video come into play and start setting off all of these inflammatory reactions, the cells start secreting mucus. And when you have this higher ratio of fluid in the lungs, then the pneumocytes or the lung cells aren't able to bind oxygen. And so they can't actually do oxygen transfer as well, which is why people end up on ventilators. Gotcha. Yeah. So that... That, that makes a lot of sense. And then there's the interesting thing about kind of the incubation phase, mm -hmm. right? So it may be at work and eventually I don't feel anything, right, at, at first. And the next thing I know, I wake up and it's extremely hard to breathe because my lungs have kind of filled with mucus overnight. Um, and it's different, for, it's different for everybody. Yeah. Would, like we talked about in the last video, to me it would make sense that if I was keeping my mucus levels to a minimum, that I would be in a better, a better position if I did happen to contract this virus, where if I already you know, was working in a, a field with a lot of pollen, if I was already eating a lot of crap that was making my nose completely full, then if that virus comes along, now I'm just mucus man. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. So uh, while mucus is part of our protective mechanism, it's like any kind of, like anything's too much. Like you, you can have too much of anything, right? We talk about sure. that in terms of strength training. You talk about that. Um, I talk about that in terms of like too much water, you know, can be a problem. So there is a balance where a certain amount of mucus is protective to you, but at a certain point it actually gets in the way of you being able to adequately breathe. So yeah, right. if you're doing other things that are already pro-inflammatory and are triggering that immune process and are creating more mucus for you, then you may be setting yourself up for some bigger problems down the road if you do come in contact with it. Yeah, so that makes me think about my own personal experience with mucus, which <laughs> is- Tell me about your experience. <laughs> maybe different. Everybody is individualized, right? So for me, I noticed that I have a tendency to blow my nose a lot more when I eat dairy. Uh -huh. And that, that's not something I don't, I don't think I'm the only person in the world that probably experiences that. And dairy in and of itself, you know, can be very nutrient dense for some people if you, if you uh, deal with it well. But for me personally, if I know if I drink a lot of milk, next thing I know, like I, I get clocked to, yeah. 
not get into too much detail. So would it <laughs> no graphic it, detail on this show. No. <laughs> None of that needed. So that makes me think, not that I do a ton of dairy, but like I have added, you know, cottage cheese back in my diet recently. So I'm like, okay, you know, can I moderate a little bit of that dairy? Or maybe, maybe just pay attention a little bit more to if I'm eating, you know, X food, what is happening? Maybe just pay, pay attention a little bit more to how frequently I'm blowing my nose. Seems like a good idea. Yeah. So I think you make a great point and anybody who's watching this again, remember that like, we are not your people, like, right? Like I'm a doctor, but I'm not your doctor. Ryan is a strength and conditioning coach, but he may not be your strength and conditioning coach. Um, so we're just talking. None of these are meant to be taken as recommendations. Um, it is true that a lot of people have a mucus reaction to dairy. Dairy tends to be a pretty pro-inflammatory food because it's mucusy just in and of itself. Um, but uh, the other reason dairy does that is because dairy is full of polysaccharides, which are just long chains of carbohydrates or long chains of sugars. And just naturally, whether you're talking about from dairy or even a plant, whatever it is, when you have polysaccharides, those actually reflexively, they like tell your mucus cells to cre secrete more mucus. So they, they just naturally do that. Um, some people get more mucus from other foods. So yes, this is very, very individualized. Um, and typically we would see in naturopathic medicine that response as your body telling you that maybe that's something it doesn't particularly like or agree with. Sure. Um, and so that's the messaging of your body trying to tell you, mm, maybe this isn't something that's so great for us. Yeah. Makes sense. So yeah. would you say that maybe people should just pay a little bit more attention to what they're eating and how they feel? Yes. I think that's, I think people should pay more attention to what they're eating, but also just to their own body reactions. You know, all of the symptoms that we experience the symptoms are not the disease the symptoms are our body's messaging telling us that it's trying to deal with something right and we'll talk about that a little bit later actually when we'll talk about fevers in this uh in this video but um i think that's really important is that when you experience something that's really your body just trying to tell you something so just listen to that and try to understand try to hear it right you mean it's not the fact that i didn't have a pill to take care of the symptom what you know maybe maybe you're, you're onto something there <laughs> maybe you're onto something there um the other thing about mucus uh you know maybe tangenting into our next thing we can talk about is that it's not just in our lungs right so we secrete mucus from all of our mucus right. membranes um so we secrete it from our lungs but we also secrete it out of our gastrointestinal system right um, and so if we're talking about food uh, and we're talking about the GI, we also know that this virus is attaching to cells in the GI or in your intestinal tract. Um, and if there's something going on in there that your body doesn't like, you'll also secrete more mucus in your gut as well. And you can actually see that in your stool. So if I'm already eating a highly inflammatory diet, which can also be very individualized, right? Mm -hmm. What might be inflammatory for you may not be as inflammatory for me, vice versa. Right. But if I'm already eating a very highly inflammatory diet, I might not be blowing my nose all the time, but my gut, on the other hand, may be secreting excess mucus. And that, as you said, we're not just seeing this in the lungs, we're also seeing it in the gut. So maybe, how, how would I know if I have excess mucus production? Um, there's many ways. So if we're talking not respiratory, if it's, most people know it, if it's in your sinus or in your lungs, right? right. Um, if it's in your gut, the gut, which I think is really an important thing that we should talk about anyway, because the gut is really where your immune system is housed. You know, so much of what's going on immune wise is in your gastrointestinal system. Um, but most of what people will experience is that they won't be digesting their food very well. And as much as like people don't like talking about it, your poop is a great way to know what's going on in your body because <laughs> it's either going to have mucus in it or it's going to have undigested food or the way it changes tells you a lot about your habits and what's going on. So, uh, you know, naturopathic doctors always joke that we're like the poop doctors. We talk about this extensively with all of our patients because it gives you, it really is a window to what's happening inside. Yeah. A little yeah. poo window. <laughs> I'm, there's a great book out there. It's What's Your Poo Telling You? Yes. <laughs> People don't talk about it, but it's that's an important thing. I think that's probably something everybody should have for their like toilet bowl reading. You for know? Sure. <laughs> for sure. Pay attention. 
<laughs> Save your life. Uh, so gut so, health. What do we want to talk about with gut health? So with gut health, there's been a lot of recommendations recently around ibuprofen. So I've been seeing don't take ibuprofen with COVID-19. And we know ibuprofen is a, is a big anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. When I was in the Navy, the joke is, right, oh, you have a broken leg, take two 800 milligram ibuprofen and call me in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> ibuprofen is just kind of cranked out for, for everybody. And I, I mean, I have a bottle of ibuprofen 800 milligrams. I don't use them yeah. frequently, but I have them on hand. Uh, ibuprofen takes down inflammation, mm -hmm. right? Now, which seems like a good idea, but if I take my inflammation down too low, I might not have an appropriate inflammatory response. Is that kind of the idea behind the recommendation of not taking ibuprofen with this? Yeah, so there's actually a couple things behind that, and you did definitely hit one of them spot on. So if you think about, so I'm going to talk about the fever now, right? So fever is a really common symptom that we're seeing with patients who uh, contract the virus, and the fever, again, back to this idea that it's a symptom, it's your body's way of telling you it's doing something. Something. So the fever is not the disease, right? The fever is your body raising your body temperature or your internal thermostat to essentially cook out the virus, you know? Right. Um, and so one, if we're taking too many NSAIDs or things like Tylenol, you know, or our ibuprofen, then that is to reduce the fever, then we're interrupting our body's innate immune system response. So we're getting in the way of it actually trying to cook out that virus. Um, the other thing about it, and Tylenol has been actually looked at specifically with this, but Tylenol, uh, the way that it works is it actually has been found in research to decrease the amount of glutathione in your cells. And glutathione is, um, it's our primary antioxidant in the body. And it has a certain specificity for the lung cells. And so it can be used as a really great antioxidant for the body's health, but especially in the lungs and helps deal with oxidative or free radical damage in the lungs due to infection. And so we want to make sure that we have glutathione in our lungs to deal with this potential infection. And Tylenol actually gets in the way of that and reduces our glutathione in the lungs mm -hmm. and in all the other cells in our body. But so beyond just re getting in the way of that fever, cooking it out, it also gets in the way of our antioxidant processes. Are there ways to upregulate my body's own endogenous glutathione production? Yeah, you can. So a lot of glutathione production is recycled through just nutrients, making sure you're getting a really nutrient rich diet. Um, mm -hmm. You know, especially like our B vitamins play a role in glutathione production. And there's uh, the precursor to glutathione is another substance called N-acetylcysteine. And um, you can actually look up, there's a lot of foods that naturally have N-acetylcysteine or glutathione in them, NAC or glutathione. Um, but either of them, they, they show up naturally in a lot of different foods and can be really, really great at bringing up your, your, natural, your natural levels of that without having to supplement. Okay. Any of those foods that I might be able to get in the middle of a pandemic? Absolutely. <laughs> Most of them are just going to be in your fresh fruits and vegetables. So like things like broccoli, your green leafies, those types of things. So this also mm -hmm. comes back to like, gut health, you know, and just to general immunity is making sure that you're eating a really nutrient dense diet. Because if you're eating the fruits and vegetables and like the high quality grass fed, organic, all of that kind of stuff, then you're going to be getting all of the nutrients you need for your body to fight. Yeah. And on the, on the opposite side of that, so NSAIDs, Tylenol, ibuprofen might decrease that glutathione, which we definitely want to help uh, in the lungs and everywhere else. Mm -hmm. Are there things that I might have in my diet that might also be decreasing that along with a Tylenol or something along those yeah, lines? Yeah, so I would be thinking any of the things that are going to be adding to your oxidative or free radical damage, right? So anything that's causing damage in the body is going to use glutathione up. So it's going to start depleting your stores. So that's going to be things like like if you're smoking cigarettes, if you're drinking a lot of alcohol, if you, you know, a lot of people don't like to believe this, but like the char on your meat, if you grill it, that black char is actually a known carcinogen and that's mm -hmm. free radical damage, right? So 
trying to avoid things like that in your diet, trying to avoid, um, you know, too much stress, not getting enough sleep, any of the things that cause a stress impact on the body is going to require our antioxidant pathways to mitigate. Sure. So, yeah. Now, I did have a little bit of char, but I added my broccoli and my fresh veggies. It's a little bit of a balance, right? It's all in balance. It's all in balance. But, you know, definitely right. don't be like charring the heck out of your, out of your steak. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's, that's fine. I like my steak pretty rare. Anyway. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Gut health. So turns out we should probably not be smoking, uh, drinking like fish and uh, eating fruits and vegetables. Fascinating. Fascinating, so right? What a novel concept. Right? Novel, just like the virus. <laughs> yeah. <you know. laughs> novels, right? Lots of novels right now. Be reading yeah. some novels. <laughs> it's an opportunity yeah. time. Uh, other things I think we should maybe address in terms of this is like, you know, food wise, things you can do that are more anti inflammatory versus pro inflammatory, right? right? And again, I think what you said is really important is that it's different for everybody. So the things I'm saying are not specific recommendations that should not be taken as such. But, um, you know, the, the kind of oil you're cooking with can make a huge difference in your body. You know, we know that oils that are more heavily processed or oils that have gone rancid are actually pro inflammatory in the body. Um, and yeah. this is really important. This is a really great check that everybody can do at their house. If you smell the oil you're cooking with, whether it's olive oil or sesame oil or whatever it is, it should smell and taste fairly similar to what it came from, right? So like olives should have a really re rich, like olivey smell and flavor. Um, fish oil should be more like the ocean. It should be very fresh. It shouldn't taste fishy, right? But if you smell the oil or if you taste it and it kind of like bites back at you, like has that burning sensation in your nose or, or tastes bad, it is rancid. And at that point, that oil is no longer anti-inflammatory. It's now pro-inflammatory and pro-carcinogenic. So, you know, that's something very, very basic everybody can take a look at at home. Yeah. So making sure you're not having rancid oils in your diet or processed oils in your diet, um, things like that. Uh, you know, grass fed meat is really important. <laughs> if you're eating meat, making sure that it's pasture raised, uh, right. or your eggs, making sure that they're pasture raised chickens, because when animals graze off of grass or off of their natural habitat, they, that grass has more omega-3. And omega-3 is more anti-inflammatory. Whereas if they're eating corn, which is higher in omega-6, you get more pro-inflammatory, right? So making sure that they're grass-fed, making sure that they don't have antibiotics in them, making sure that there's not pesticides or herbicides, because all of the research on those actually shows that even if they're just sprayed on the ground, like the neonicotinoids, that's a pesticide that when it's sprayed on the ground, it gets absorbed into the food. And that has been shown to directly inhibit gut regulation of the immune system. Yes. One of, the, one of my favorite ways that I've heard that explained is, you know, we're not necessarily what we eat. A lot of people say, you know, you are what you eat, but you are what you eat eats. Yes. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> We are what we eat eats. So, <laughs> so you're saying I should I should choose foods and, and uh, I should I should choose plants and animals that were raised naturally and grown yes. naturally. It's yes. A novel concept. <laughs> it is a novel concept. <laughs> and that and that gives me just a little bit more preparedness if my body does come in contact with this virus. Yes. So well, I feel pretty good about, about my gut health right now. Excellent. Uh, as far as oils go, quick question, are there certain oils? So I know there are some oils that are prone to getting rancid quicker. Your highly processed vegetable oils, right? Like the stuff probably most people just shouldn't have in their house, your canola oils, things like that. Things like coconut oil, Coconut oil seems like one of those fairly benign. Again, you could have a coconut allergy. I don't know. Like, again, I am not your strength coach. Kelsey might not be your doctor. But things like uh, coconut oil seems like 
it wouldn't go rancid as quickly. Am I right in that assumption? That's correct, but it also depends on how people are using it. So coconut oil is more of a medium heat oil, so it's not a great oil to be doing like a high heat stir fry in. Um, gotcha. So its smoke point is is a little bit higher than olive oil, but not significantly. And as soon as your pan starts smoking, oil's rancid. Forget it. <laughs> So, you know, the oils that I actually tend to use more of are like avocado oil. Um, it seems to be a little bit more stable. It's yeah. a much higher heat oil. Uh, and it, it just seems, that just seems to be a little bit more stable for most people. Sure. Yeah. Avocado oil. Yeah. I like it. So you did a video switching gears just a little bit, something I'm pretty interested in. You did a video recently on estrogen and testosterone. And a study that came out recently about how estrogen and testosterone levels may affect your immune system. Can you dive into that a little bit? Yeah. So I'll just keep it brief because you guys can go watch my video if you want to get more into that. So um, I actually am specializing more in men's health. So that's where a lot of my interest is currently is how that may be affecting uh, not just men and women differently, but people who have higher levels of testosterone versus people who have higher levels of estrogen. Um, so basically what research has found, and this research has been going on longer than just now, right? This isn't new, but is we've recognized that estrogen actually is an immune promoter. So it upregulates the immune system. It can trigger a stronger immune response. And we've seen that in different cultures around the world, including hunter gatherer populations that when a virus comes through the community, the women in the community tend to actually survive it a little bit better and men tend to to suffer more from it and so we've seen we've seen that just culturally but then in the research we actually find that estrogen upregulates different parts of the immune response whereas testosterone may play more of an inhibitory role mm -hmm. and so what i was talking about in that video is that where men may be at greater risk or people who have higher levels of testosterone may be at a little bit greater risk of the the virus or the symptoms or side effects of the virus um however what i also tried to explain in there is that you know nothing nothing in health is ever one variable right so it's right. not just okay you have more testosterone you're at greater risk for the virus right it's that along with what are all the other variables that come into play with your health are you a chronic smoker do you have a cor a comorbidity like cardiovascular disease or diabetes or kidney disease um are you binge drinking are you you know depressed are you socially isolated and not in the way that we are right now but more chronically long term all of those things play a role in dampening your immune system and you know what the the thing i was trying to say is it's not just one variable but it is interesting that men tend to be or tend to take up a higher proportion of those groups of people with chronic disease and who are binge drinking a little bit more and who aren't getting enough sleep and who are maybe over working out. And so yeah. I think there's, there's a lot at play there. And that, you know, not always, but men typically tend to overdo things a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> we may drink a little bit more. We may smoke a little bit more, um, just do things a little bit more to excess. And I think it's, it's interesting, you know, sometimes these, these studies come out, and everybody jumps on and says, testosterone's bad, mm -hmm. you know? And this isn't saying, hey, let's see how high we can get our estrogen levels up. No, that might help. no, no. Not, it's not what we're saying, right? No, that's not at all what we're saying. I mean, testosterone plays a very important role in the body for men and women, right? Mm -hmm. we, we all have testosterone and estrogen in our bodies, just in varying degrees. Um, right. It's more just interesting research yeah. to just see how all of that comes into play and and that this may not be the time to be trying to excessively increase your testosterone keeping it at a healthy level or a balanced level sure but trying to con like push too hard at the gym or trying to you know doing exogenous est or testosterone injections or things like that maybe not the best choice right now so <laughs> Maybe don't get on a steroid cycle in the middle of this pandemic. Right. That, that, yeah. <laughs> Even though you're stuck at home and can't go to the gym, not a good time for those. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and I think, you know, a lot of folks out there from, from research that I've seen, when people are tested for their just natural testosterone levels, if someone's carrying excess body fat, typically that brings down their testosterone. So most people could probably stand to bring their testosterone up a little bit. 
versus, you know, two out of three Americans right now are in the category of overweight or obese. So they probably already have a little bit of a lower testosterone level, right. excess fat, which in and of itself is one of those comorbidities that we're looking at that may put them at a higher risk of any sort of virus. Right. So actually adipose tissue or that excess fat tissue is considered an endocrine organ because adipose tissue secretes a certain kind of estrogen in the body. So it actually upregulates the amount of estrogen, which then offsets the ratio of estrogen to testosterone. Um, so if we're looking at it in terms of the hormone part of the immune system, it's doing that. But then, yes, we also know that just besides that, having excess adipose tissue on the body does it is, it is a chronic disease that can lower your immune system and put you at greater risk. Right. Excess adipose tissue is not a protector from Correct. this. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> cool. What next? Well, so in, in that, so talking about, talking about testosterone, you know, if we're looking at testosterone, if we're looking at estrogen, we know that just like I'm sneezing, well, maybe I shouldn't just take something to get rid of my sneeze. Like, what is it that I, why am I sneezing? So we know that vitamin D3 is, can be a precursor to testosterone. And although, again, I'm not a dietitian, can't prescribe, you know, specific vitamins or anything like that, that the research behind vitamin D3 seems to be pretty clear in that from everything from anxiety, depression, gut health. I mean, most people by February are deficient in vitamin D3. And we know that low levels of vitamin D3 can be risk factors for a host of illnesses. It would make sense to me that I would want to get my, my D3 up or potentially just have it checked or maybe see where my vitamin D3 levels are at. Where do you, where do you stand on the D3? Yeah, so vitamin D, um, and again, this is not a recommendation, right? It's important that anybody who's watching this actually talks to their healthcare provider because D, D3 can be, you know, you can go toxic on D3. It's a fat soluble vitamin. It's one of the four. So you also want to make sure that you're not doing so much of it that you put yourself into a place that's going to cause problems for your liver. Um, so this is not a recommendation, uh, but vitamin D3 plays a role in many of our immune processes. It plays a big role in our immune system. It also helps get calcium deposited into our bones. So it plays a big role in our bone health, which our bones are really just, they're really just a repository for like balancing other minerals in the body, you know? So like we, we want to support our bones and keep them healthy, but we also want to make sure we have adequate calcium for our heart to do its job properly. Um, and so vitamin D helps with that. Vitamin D is also really helpful in the nervous system. And so it can actually help with mood. It can help with nerve conduction. Um, it does help with hormone regulation. So it is very important. So if we're talking about just in terms of general body wellness, there is a growing amount of research that shows that vitamin D can be very supportive to the body. Now, how much to take? Now, that's completely individualized. Um, it used to be that at least in, over the last decade, people were a little bit more I think lacks about high dosing vitamin D and now there's a little bit of concern about doing that. And so I'm not, I'm not going to say any dosages on here because people take things to heart too quickly, but um, you know, there, there is a good level of vitamin D that we usually like to see people's levels in. So uh, you know, the, the range in the United States is somewhere between like 30 and a hundred. But if you look everywhere else in the world, it's like 70 to 130. <laughs> so I usually like to see people somewhere in the seventies and the way you get there is totally based on your recommendations with your provider. Sure. Yeah. Sunshine also a source of, of vitamin D, right? It is the problem though that we all run into is that if you go out into the sun, but you're covered in sunscreen, you can't absorb that. You, your body can't process the vitamin D properly, but we also don't want people going out without any protection on their sun and burning themselves. Cause that's very dangerous, right? So just spending time outside and at like a safe amount of time outside, like maybe 10 or 15 minutes that you're getting the sunlight on your face, that you're getting it on your body, on your arms, like then you will, your body can start manufacturing its own vitamin D. Excellent. And that's, that validates my time outside yesterday. So yes. that's my own personal, um, my own personal version of, you know, getting that vitamin D. So I've been trying to get out. It's been really nice in Colorado. 
So yesterday, you know, it was in the 60s. So what I tend to do, I'll put some, I'll put a little bit of sunscreen on my face, but then I try to open up, you know, larger areas of my body, but maybe 10, 10 minutes on one side, 10 minutes on the other. Yeah. Not enough to burn. Kind of right. like, you know, a little bit of inflammation is good. A lot, not so great. And if you want to talk about a mass inflammation, that's what a sunburn is, right? <laughs> like yeah. you just inflame the crap out of your body. You burned yourself. Yeah, you know, it's it's like hard boiling an egg. There's a fine line between you know overcooking that thing. It's just yeah. that. <laughs> be great. Once we get past soft boiled into just like chalk. <laughs> yeah. So a, a little bit of sunshine, and you know I, I know there are some folks out there that that's c- conflicting things, but I I think you know we've been out in the sun as a human species more than we haven't been in the sun. So now's a time where, you know, you might just be able to go outside. You have a little bit of time, maybe get some sun on your face. Don't burn yourself. Right. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah. Which again is going to be different for everybody. Very fair skinned people like me. Yes. Maybe can't be out as long, you know? <laughs> um, okay. So I want to talk about briefly before we close up here about movement, right. Mm-hmm. And mindfulness, because a lot of people I know are, stuck inside, they're anxious, and they don't know how to approach all the, I mean, there's, we're just being inundated with information, right? And like, information is great, but how do you utilize that to your benefit? So uh, I would like to talk to you about what your recommendations would be right now, um, and maybe what we can focus on to help reduce inflammation and support anxiety levels in a healthy way. Yes. Right now. Absolutely. So I have And I know, I think we're going to do another video on this specifically Mm -hmm. about strength training recommendations, how you can strength train legitimately at home where you don't need a bunch of barbells and and a ton of weights. And I think right now, especially with, especially specifically, how many words can I use it in and why? Apparently, (laughs) essentially. (laughs) Critically. (laughs) Critically. Strength. So I I talk a lot about strength training. Often when people hear strength training, they might associate the gym, right? They might associate a barbell, a dumbbell, a kettlebell. And although all of those are tools that you can use for strength training, what I'm really talking about is getting yourself stronger. And in this scenario, I'm going to do a video a little bit later today of what I call being an asset and not a liability. And what I mean by that is if I'm strong enough to be able to move my own body or help my fellow man, fellow woman, fellow human, uh, I, that puts me as an asset, especially in a time like this where things are a little bit up in the air. Nobody really knows what's going to happen. I would like to know that I'm strong enough to be able to help someone. Mm-hmm. And if I'm talking about strength specifically, I think now is an awesome time for people to really focus on getting stronger. There's a lot of people, especially with CrossFit being one of the most popular fitness systems out there, there's a lot of people that think they need to crush themselves in every workout. And there's, there's a phenomenon known as the Fran cough, which is where uh, Fran is a, is a classic CrossFit workout where uh, it's, it's often, oftentimes at the end of this workout, people are left with this cough. They can't really breathe too well. Uh, it's because they're pushing themselves so hard. And although you may get stronger several days after that, you're really taking your body down a little rabbit hole when you beat the crap out of yourself in a workout. And really what I'm, what I'm trying to say with this is I think during this time, if you're going to be doing the fitness, right? If you're going to implement fitness as a part of your lifestyle, I think, I think strength training as far as getting your body stronger, putting your body under tension versus just high intensity workouts. Strength training, in my personal opinion, is a better opportunity right now, especially since you've all probably had those workouts. Anybody who's had a very high intense workout, you may have had that cough afterwards. You may have had that burn in your lungs. Well, if I have this burning in my lungs and I can't really breathe too well because I've just beat the crap out of myself in this workout, and now that virus comes along, to me, that that doesn't seem like a win-win scenario. Whereas if I wasn't beating the crap out of myself, but maybe I was focusing a little bit more on slower, more controlled movements and really building strength versus building crazy cardio conditioning, I can still go out and walk. 
right? I can get a nice base level, a nice aerobic base. I can get some light cardio, but I don't have to be sprinting right now and, you know, killing myself in these workouts. So my, my recommendation would maybe be to dial it back just a little bit. You can still train consistently every day. You can work on building your strength. We can talk about that a little bit more in the later video, but maybe, you know, every workout doesn't have to be for time and just beating the crap out of yourself. Does that yeah. make sense? I think that's a great point. I think that's a great point. So you mentioned that we're going to be doing some videos later. So for people who are interested in following along and seeing either what we're talking about together, or what we're talking about separately, where can people find you? Sure. We can follow. So you can follow the business, which is Existence Athletics. So Existence spelled with an A stands for an active existence. You can follow that on Facebook, our Facebook page, our Instagram page, or myself on Instagram. Ryan Mitchell Humphreys. I think I'm the only Ryan Mitchell Humphreys on there. <laughs> so that's where they could find me. Where can they find you? Um, so you guys can follow me in a number of places. So um, I have both my clinic that I manage and my own pages. So if you want to follow me, you can follow me on Instagram or Facebook at Dr. Kelsey Asplin, K-E-L-S-E-Y. A-S-P-L-I-N. I'm certainly the only one on there. So, so you should be able to find me pretty well. Um, we also have a Facebook group. So if you search under the groups for Denver Naturopathic Clinic, that's just a group community where I will be doing talks um, and maybe live webinars with anybody who wants to be involved in that. Uh, and if you go over to our website at denvernaturopathic.com and you, we are like top banner is actually specifically about the virus and you can download a free download I've created about things you can do at home to keep your immune system strong. If you do that, then you'll get on our list and then you won't miss any of the information that we're sending out and getting more in depth into these topics. Nice. Yeah. Well, awesome. Thanks so much, Ryan, for coming yep. on again. Thank you. Talking I about mucus. Love mucus. <laughs> Just the, right uh, just the right amount. Just the right amount. So stay tuned. We're going to be doing another video where we'll be talking specifically about strength training and how to approach strength training if you've never done it before. Um, and Ryan may actually run me through a couple exercises so you can see exactly what we're talking about and what you can do at home. Cool. Cool. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you. Bye. See ya.